So I'd like to welcome everyone to a special edition of The Diplomatic Pouch, ISD's online magazine. Today we're doing a video interview with Ambassador Sullivan, um, Ambassador John Sullivan, um, who was the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State from May 2017 to December 2019, and then U.S. Ambassador to Russia from February 2020 to just recently September 2022. So Ambassador Sullivan, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks. It's my pleasure. Delighted to be with you. So I'm going to start off. Um, we were just joking about this, but uh, I'm going to start off jokingly and and with a question. I'm sure you haven't gotten very much lately, um, but to talk about uh, Russia and the war in Ukraine um, as we're entering into the. You just mentioned you've been doing a lot of interviews in the lead up to to you know it's already coming up on the one year anniversary. So I, I'd like to get at your thoughts on. You know, what was it, you know, what was it like being there as ambassador when this all began? And, you know, how has it evolved in your mind over the course of the last year and sort of surprised you in one way or the other? Um, and, uh, you know, what do you think the future holds at this point? Easy question. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it uh, what I can tell you was not a surprise was that the Russians invaded, reinvaded Ukraine on a large scale um, in February of 22. I knew it, several of us senior officials in the U.S. government, we knew what was coming. We tried to a negotiate uh, or, or dissuade the Russians from doing this unsuccessfully, and B, alert others who should be should be prepared what was coming. So it wasn't February twenty fourth wasn't a surprise to me. Um, it it is is it was and is a tragedy. Uh, sitting in my office at the embassy early in the morning of the twenty fourth, reading the reports that were coming in of what. Uh, you know, what the special military operation, which I think at that point we didn't know it was called a special military operation, uh, but what the invasion, uh, the scale of it, uh, even though it wasn't a surprise, it was still uh, a very, very grim uh, morning. And I, I personally had invested a lot of time and effort years, both as deputy secretary and as ambassador to try and make some modest progress on at least a few areas where we could continue to have dialogue with the Russian government, uh, whether it was on uh, strategic security talks, uh, climate change, uh, those uh, we had uh, commercial relations, substantial commercial relations, even post the sanctions that were imposed in 2014 15. We had 1,200 US companies doing business in Russia uh, before the war started. And I knew on February 24th that all of that work was, uh, you know, was, was now ended. There was nothing more to talk about when swarms of Russian soldiers and tanks and aircraft and missiles crossed the international border on the 24th. It was a whole new world and uh, not a uh, not a bright, optimistic world either. A very grim, grim time still is a grim time with the destruction that's been wrought in Ukraine. Almost 15 million people um, who have become either Ukrainians who have become either refugees or internally displaced. Tens of thousands of innocent people killed. It's uh, it's a catastrophe, and uh, the relations between the United States and Russia were in very very bad shape before February twenty fourth, twenty twenty two, and there's not much left of them uh, now. Very few uh, contacts between the Russian government and the United States government. Yeah, and that kind of gets me to the, my to my next question. Um, Although this will entail more than the United States and Russia for obvious reasons, but you mentioned that it's it, you know the February twenty fourth a year ago created a whole new world, but in many ways it it created a whole new world that was hearkening back towards great power conventional warfare on a scale that we haven't seen in a you know since World War II, especially in that region of the world, um, and that makes it very much all about military capabilities right now and who can sort of gain the upper hand and and things like that throughout the war and hasn't gotten us anywhere close to diplomacy yet um but do, do you think there's any possible possibility uh for diplomacy 
short of one side completely winning and the other side losing. And and what do you think, having been in Russia for a couple of years and, you know, speaking with Vladimir Putin and everything, what do you think his end game is here? Is it anything short of, of you know, gaining at least the eastern Donbass region in, in Ukraine? Well, uh, my experience in negotiations with the Russians before the special military operation began and all that's happened since tell me that the Russian government has absolutely no interest in good faith negotiations to bring about a uh, some sort of conclusion to this this war. Uh, they weren't serious about negotiations before the war. Why do I say that? Having sat in uh, enough negotiations with the Russians who were merely reading from scripts, unwilling to engage in unscripted dialogue, uh, reciting press points. They were going through a charade of diplomacy from the very top, President Putin on down. There was no interest in uh, negotiations. In the United States and our NATO allies, we're, we were not negotiating on behalf of Ukraine. As you recall, our, our standard talking point was no, no negotiations about Ukraine without Ukraine at the table. But um, the security guarantees that Russia sought, we were prepared to discuss security architecture in Europe, but the Russian government had no interest in uh, in negotiating uh, at that time, and I believe still doesn't. If you listen very carefully to what uh, what Putin, what uh, Peskov, Lavrov, what they all say, they've said since the first day, they've never varied from the formulation that the goals of the special military operation will be achieved. And what do they say the goals are? The goals are denazifying and demilitarizing Ukraine. And I translate that into removing the democratically elected government in Kyiv and subjecting the Ukrainian people to uh, to Russian authority. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean a military occupation. It could be a union state relationship like they have with, uh, with Belarus, Belarus. But the one thing they've been consistent about in saying the rationale for the invasion has shifted over time. It was a Ukrainian genocide against Russians. It was Ukraine was developing new nuclear weapons, Ukraine was going to invade Russia, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes right down to it, what they always say is the goals of the special military operation will be achieved and the goals haven't changed. They say they describe them as denazifying and demilitarizing Ukraine. And they say that to this day. And if anything, the the the, uh, the Russian rhetoric, including Putin's uh, recent speech, um, at what they call for a day or two to celebrate the 80, they, uh, they celebrated the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Stalingrad. They've renamed, basically renamed the city Stalingrad for a day. Uh, in his speech commemorating that, uh, that landmark battle in the Great Patriotic War, he's doubling down. He is not, uh, he has no interest in, uh, in negotiations. Everyone always asks me, what are the off-ramps? What off-ramps would Putin take? What off-ramps does he want? And I say he does not want off-ramps. He won't take off-ramps. If we want to use a highway or turnpike analogy, um, he'd settle for the Vladimir Vladimirovich rest area on the New Jersey turnpike to rest and regroup and refit, but he does not want an off-ramp. And on the other hand, uh, President Zelensky doesn't either. And even if he did, the Ukrainian people wouldn't let him take one. Uh, this is uh, these are entrenched adversaries, and as you noted, uh, it's it's become a World War One style, uh, uh, you know, slugfest with artillery, uh, small, uh, you know, small arms warfare among among troops in a very very small area of isolated area. The way the Western Front was. The line didn't move very much from uh, late 1914 into 1918. Similarly, the front line, which is lengthy across uh, across the Donbass, hasn't hasn't moved very much, at least since since last fall. I don't see a way forward with negotiations in the foreseeable future. Um, neither side is interested in it at this point. Yeah, that doesn't uh, or that uh, that doesn't uh portend well for um diplomatic talks uh when both sides are so entrenched and it uh 
speaks to what could be a very you know bloody spring as uh, offensives pick back up. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, it does, though, in some sense, when we talk about it that way, it does suggest some sort of equivalence. Uh, there's no equivalent between what Russia has done. This is an aggressive war. And if we, President Putin loves to invoke World War II uh, and the Great Patriotic War as justification, in part, historical justification for what he's doing. I think the more apt analogy, if we want a World War II analogy, is the German rationale for uh, invading Poland on September 1st, 1939. A phony border drawn, drawn in Germany's east that separated the German Volk, a, a border drawn uh, as, as the result of a war like the Cold War, that uh, the Germans didn't lose the Great War, according to Hitler. Uh, Putin says they didn't lose the Cold War. Uh, the uh, Gorbachev and weak need uh, leaders in the late 80s and 90s, sort of a, a, a communist equivalent of the great stab in the back. But as a result of that border, Germans were separated from Germans, Russians are separated from Russians, and both leaders invoking great historic figures, Hitler, Frederick the Great, Putin, Peter the Great, said that their people were subject to, in, 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 uh, in, in the German case, Hitler said that his Germans, his folk, were being uh, subjected to Polish barbarism, his phrase. Uh, Putin makes the same makes the same argument. So yeah, there's an echo of World War II, uh, and that echo is doesn't favor the Russian interpretation of what's happening. And oh, by the way, those senior German leaders, including the Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop, who were responsible for that aggressive war, that was the first crime charged at Nuremberg, crime against peace, waging an aggressive war. They hanged for that. Yeah, and there, as you note, there's been uh, multiple instances of, of historical rewriting being being go, or going on, especially on the Russian side, with um, you know it, the the lack of Ukraine being a state and calling back right. to, you know all these uh, things from World War II. Um, it's been uh, he's been a a mythologizer, uh, uh, bar none, um, bar none. So. Um, so I want to switch gears here a little bit and talk to you um, about sort of serving in government and in foreign policy positions during sort of a tumultuous time in your own country's history. Um, right. You know, as as you well know, and as our our I guess we're our readers of the diplomatic pouch um, know very well, we are in a very partisan time in United States history. Um, and you served in both the Trump administration and the Biden administration. So I just kind of what was your take on that? And how have you been able to sort of navigate multiple parties uh, during this period? And 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 even in a time when we've seen that foreign policy, you know, it used to be something that stopped at the water's edge, and that's not the case anymore. So how have you navigated this time period? Yeah, no, it, you know, it, uh, it sounds more challenging, at least with respect to Russia, than it was uh, in the following sense. There was very little disagreement within the Trump administration or the Biden administration for that matter on the fundamental thrust of US policy with respect to Russia. Now, Trump had his own idea of how he thought he could engage to his benefit, Vladimir Putin. Um, he thought he could, uh, you know, using his skills as a, a deal maker in New York, do deals with Putin, uh, suck up to Putin. He uh, declined our advice that he not congratulate Putin on his reelection in 2018, famously uh, ignoring written advice that came from my my friend and former colleague, General McMaster. Um, but he did that with every foreign leader. He thought he could influence G, Modi, you name it. He had an idea that he was a deal maker. He was doing deals. And his perspective was it was more deals uh, that he thought were good for, for the United States. But uh, there, there, you know, with Russia, unlike with China, where there were where there were deals that were made with Russia, we never got past. 
uh, you know, the the pleasantries or attempted pleasantries between Trump and Putin, um, the R- Russian behavior, whether it was election interference, the uh, use of a uh, Novichok nerve agent in in Salisbury, um, support for the Lukashenko's regime, crushing of uh, opposition in Belarus, the Navalny poisoning, the list goes goes on and on. Um, and my principal interaction in the Trump administration was with Secretary Pompeo. In fact, I never spoke. I spoke a lot to Donald Trump when I was deputy secretary. I spoke not once to the president uh, while I was ambassador. Uh, I spoke a lot with Secretary Pompeo, and his view and my view on Russia were uh, were, were the same. So there was, my, from my perspective as ambassador in Moscow, there was not a lot of substantive shift from January 19th, 2021 to January 20th, when President Biden was uh, inaugurated. And I, I was quite pleased and honored that the uh, that the president elect and then President Biden kept me in my post in Moscow enjoyed the work it it was and is important work even to, to this to this day although we have much more limited engagement um I'll cite a few differences uh between administrations I mentioned that I I never spoke to uh, President Trump about Russia or my role as ambassador I did speak of course, to President Biden uh, quite a bit. In fact, I accompanied President Biden on his uh, trip to uh, to have a summit meeting or a meeting with President Putin in uh, in Geneva. I had a lot more contact with the White House, and this is before the war. I mean, after the war started, it was every day around the clock video teleconferences with the NSC. But but even before then, starting in mid January. Uh, late January of 21, a lot more engagement with the NSC, more DCs, PCs, NSCs with the president involved. And uh, to the White House's credit, to uh, my friend Jake Sullivan's credit, they always included me from Moscow in NSC meetings with the president on Russia, PCs and DCs. So the process changed in a sense in that I was There were more meetings, policy meetings. I was included in them, more engagement with the White House, more engagement with the president. There was a ratcheting up of the U.S. US opposition to Russia. So, for example, uh, in the midst of the campaign in the fall of late summer and fall of 20, the United States didn't impose sanctions on Russia for the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. We ultimately caught up, the EU did, then the EU imposed a second round of sanctions, Navalny sanctions, after he was arrested uh, in uh, in January of 21. The US joined the, joined the EU in imposing sanctions for Navalny's arrest, but did more and basically caught up to what the EU had done um, in response to the poisoning of Navalny in the prior August. Uh, but the basic thrust of, of uh, the downward spiral of U.S.-Russia relations, our opposition to what uh, what the Russians were doing, whether it was in Libya, Central African Republic, trying to work with them in Syria, where uh, my, my friend Jim Jeffrey was our, our special representative. Um, it was pretty tough sledding and virtually no progress. So substantively, on the big picture, not a big change. Uh, around the periphery, a little tougher on Russia, and the process changed. Yeah, and that, as as you mentioned too, a lot of that makes sense as as once you realize that the Russians are, are ramping up to go to war in Ukraine, um, it steps up the the meetings and sort of uh, involvement that you have to play on that. But um, so I want to get I'll get you out of here on one uh, last question, and I want to sort of encompass your. Uh, entire time back in government in the last uh, few years. And, you know, we noted and you mentioned that your time as deputy secretary, uh, which covered Russia, but also every issue that the United States has ongoing in the international affairs realm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, obviously you're talking a lot these days about Russia because you were the ambassador there most recently. And it's in the news because there's a horrific war going on. 
but the rest of the world doesn't stop um, just because there's a war in Ukraine. Um, so what are some of the other you know issues that you dealt with as deputy or that were on your radio radar that you still are paying <laughs> attention to today or or you see as you know major challenges for the United States beyond Russia, Ukraine? Well, you know, I use that that very line that the world doesn't stop uh, when you know Washington is is distracted. Uh, when I was the acting Secretary of State uh, for six weeks between the transition from Secretary Tillerson to Secretary Pompeo, I said it on the day that Trump fired uh, Secretary Tillerson by tweet. I told my colleagues at a senior staff meeting, the leadership of the department, that. The world doesn't stop spinning just because, you know, there's there are unsettled times in in Washington, and uh, we can't be distracted by uh, by the war in Ukraine. Certainly, we've got to be laser focused on it, but we it can't be our uh, you know to the exclusion of what <clears throat> my colleagues, both in the Trump administration and now in the Biden administration, has said is the generational challenge, which is China. On China policy in the Trump administration, there was a lot more hands-on by President Trump. It was uh, in Russia, we had, we, uh, both the political appointees and the career officers, and not just at the department, but across the interagency. Um, I mean, we would give bring proposals to President Trump, and for the most part, he would approve them. For example, the expulsion of 60 Russian uh, spies, uh, nominal diplomats, or as my uh, the the Moldovan ambassador to uh, to Russia told me when I was ambassador in Moscow, he described the SVR officers who are sent to many Russian posts, diplomatic posts around the world. That in uh, Chisinau, they call them multifunctional diplomats. We uh, we expelled sixty multifunctional dis- diplomats for the most part, SVR officers, some GRU, some FSB, and Trump absolutely uh, supported that. In fact, in that meeting in the Oval Office, at one point, Trump turned to me and I was making the case for doing, you know, making making the expulsions, and he turned to me and he looked at me. I was the acting Secretary of State at the time, and I don't know if he thought I was. Uh, well, I, he he was reacting to my arguments to do this, and he looked at me and said, "You know, I understand that that Putin and the Russians aren't our friends, but I'm, I've digressed back to Russia, China. So, under Secretary Pompeo, uh, we uh, you you may have seen within the last year, Secretary Blinken uh, and the State Department have created a China House, which is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, an echo of the." Uh, at the CIA, the the famous Russia House at uh, at at the agency, but it's an indication of how pervasive uh, diplomacy with China is at the State Department. And we started this actually in the Trump administration under Secretary Pompeo, uh, trying to integrate China. All of the different there are like forty seven or forty eight assistant secretaries of state. Every single one of them, whether it's a regional assistant secretary or a functional assistant secretary, every one of them has an interest in China. China affects what they were doing. Trying to trying to reconcile and bring together the State Department uh, as an institution to meet the challenge that is China. And it's it's not just uh, Taiwan. It's not just a military challenge. It's it's a it's a bigger uh, competition uh, with China, uh, and uh, so that was a, a big undertaking in uh, in the second half of my tenure as deputy secretary. At the fr- in the first half of my tenure. Uh, you know, things like withdrawing from the JCPOA, which a number of us, including cabinet members, disagreed with. But I think the president, it took some time into the administration before he ultimately withdrew. I think he was going to do it in his heart. He really wanted to do it. And we kept pushing back and pushing back. Uh, But that was a big issue. And then trying to explain it to our European allies and partners, what we were 
uh, what were we doing? Moving the embassy, U.S. embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in the spring. Well, we announced it in uh, late 2017, the president did. And that was a pretty, there was a pretty significant security issue there because we were worried about demonstration and potential violence at U.S. posts, particularly uh, in uh, countries with uh, large, Muslim, large Muslim populations. And there were demonstrations in, uh, in, in some, uh, some countries, but no, uh, no violence. But that was a daily, uh, multiple meetings a day with my counterpart at the Pentagon and the Joint Staff, General Paul Selva, uh, and then, you know, with occasional participation from the secretaries, uh, Tillerson and Mattis and HR at the NSC, making sure that that uh, we were buttoned up and were ready to protect our uh, our diplomatic properties. Uh, and then there was the actual opening. So that was the announcement in, I believe it was December. Um, and then to my surprise, we were actually able to get uh, on a shoestring budget, uh, a portion of what had been part of our consulate in Jerusalem converted into some in, into a building that we could call the embassy, and then going to that embassy opening in May of late May of two thousand eighteen. Uh, you know, I'm just I'm the things that pop into my mind is as in milestone events during my tenure as uh, as as deputy secretary. The uh, Longstanding uh, feud, I think, is the best way to describe it, uh, in uh, in the Persian Gulf uh, with uh, with with Qatar, which uh, upended uh, Mid East policy and occupied a lot of Secretary Tillerson's time. The anomalous health incidents in uh, that started at our embassy in Havana. Uh, but became a global issue, and it still persists to this day. I'm just going down an issue, a, you know, a, uh, just spotting issues that pop into my mind. But, but of, each one of those, I like is, one of the you know, each one of those is is major on its own, and you, you know, it speaks to that phrase of the world doesn't stop just because there's a war over here, or you know, all these different things are happening. And um, you know, just I'm thinking about your comments about just trying to integrate China policy and what we're doing on China just within the State Department, but then understanding the the the, the size of the China, China challenge and understanding that we need to integrate like that across the entire U.S. government and just what what a challenge that is alone, just trying to, in, to integrate within the U.S. I'll give government. you one example. I'll give you one example, trying to keep track, just Chinese investment and projects um, in uh, Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the Africa Bureau at the State Department. And so the Bureau is doing a good job of keeping track of that, but then making sure our WHA Bureau, our Western Hemisphere Bureau, is comparing notes with how Chinese investment in Brazil, Argentina, et cetera, compares to Chinese investment in Angola, Kenya, et cetera, and doing that on a global, just on the regional bureaus, putting together uh, a, uh, a system, uh, a, 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 uh, a, you know, keeping track of those investments uh, by region, comparing energy projects with other infrastructure projects, that sort of thing. Uh, just on the, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, geographically, that in and of itself was an enormous undertaking and something that the State Department isn't uh, isn't used to doing. The regional bureaus, uh, you know, stick to their their regional issues. Right. We do have. An undersecretary for political affairs. It was uh, first Tom Shannon and then David Hale in uh, in the Trump administration, and now uh, who are good friends of mine, and now Toria Newland, who's uh, who's a good friend. But it's it's not it's not something that one undersecretary, even with a large staff of special assistants, can do. It requires leadership from from the secretary. Yeah, because those are you know the the they 
they seem like small things to, to outsiders, but when actually considering doing these sort of things within a large bureaucracy like that, it does take buy-in from the top and it takes work. Um, and uh, and then over generation have never done something like this. Yeah. Yes. So. It, it was a, it, it, it took, it, it took two and a half years in the, in the Trump administration. And now the secretary, I hope secretary Blinken is Blinken has, has uh, reaped the rewards of some of the preliminary work we did. And has now taken it to a new level with, uh, with the China house but again, it's not it's not a you know a joint staff OSD confronting China militarily. It's just keeping track of what this right. economic colossus, which has interests that are different from ours, is doing, and how are we going to respond to it? Well, Ambassador Sullivan, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, I thought this was great, and uh, thanks for joining the diplomatic pouch. Oh, it was, it was my pleasure. Anytime.